Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karel, and I'm the engineering manager of the identity platform team uh, at Tricentis. And before uh, we jump into the topic uh, to get your attention after the break, I will uh, show you a short clip illustrating how it usually looks when an engineering manager like me uh, presents some technical topic to senior engineers. Uh, I say engineering manager like me, not like Jakub, who had great technical talk about uh, Java virtual threads. So this is me talking about Kubernetes. And these are senior engineers listening. It's not completely accurate because I have two kids, uh, not just one. OK, so now expectations are clear. So let's start with explaining uh, one important, important term, which is a workload. So the title of this uh, presentation is Service to Service Authentication, but Spiffy and Spire, they don't talk much about services. They talk a lot about workloads. So what is considered as a workload? So it's a single piece of software for a single purpose. It may be multiple running instances, and granularity varies uh, depending on, on the context. It could be microservices, it could be serverless functions, applications in virtual machines or background jobs. It's a, it's a piece of software, it's not a person or a user. And now imagine we have a bunch of workloads running in your environment, and they are talking to each other, and they are talking to the outside world. And we want to protect them. So the traditional approach is parameter-based security. So you build a wall around them, and you uh, make some small gaps if you want to uh, talk to the outside world. Uh, but inside the perimeter, uh, everyone is a friend, and everyone trusts each other. And this approach can work well, uh, but it, it uh, gets more challenging uh, as the environment grows. So in practice, your env environment may look more like this picture, where you have many more workloads. You can have hundreds or thousands of workloads in your perimeter, and you can have many workloads sitting on the wall, talking to e each side of the wall. You can also have multiple environments linked together, and the boundary may be blurry at some places. And then it's much harder to protect the perimeter. The, the attack surface is uh, much bigger. And uh, it leads us to the zero trust principle. So when you are a workload inside, uh, you shouldn't blindly trust your neighbors. Uh, zero, the zero, zero trust prin uh, principle says never trust, uh, always verify. And uh, imagine now that you are a workload and some other workload talks to you. So you shouldn't trust blindly, you should verify. So you want to authorize uh, the, the client in, in this example. And uh, you want to check if this workload is allowed to talk to you. And to do that, you need to know who's talking to you, so you need to identify the workload. And not just that, you also need to verify the identity, so you, need, you want to authenticate. And Spiffy and Spire uh, aim to solve the first two, uh, first two topics, so uh, they want to solve the ident identity and authentication, and authorization is explicitly out of the scope. Because apparently, if you uh, have verified identity, authorization should be simple. And what is it then, Spiffy Inspire? So Spiffy stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. And it's an open source uh, set of open source standards and specifications. So it's not something you can deploy. It's something you can follow, or you can use tools that follow or implement the standard. 
And the main goal is solve the identity and authentication without long-lived shared secrets, which are considered as not secure enough, and solve it in hybrid environments. So uh, in environments where you have workloads on-prem, you have workloads in AWS or Azure, and you want a universal approach to authentication ac across these environments. And uh, it's uh, a CNCF project, Cloud Native Computing Foundation project, uh, as, uh, for example, Kubernetes is. And it's been adopted by uh, several popular tools and frameworks, uh, but majority of these tools uh, implement only part of the standard. For example, they recognize spiffy identity. Uh, some of them implement more of the standard, but the most major project implementing SPIFI is SPIRE, which stands for SPIFI Runtime Environment. And it's an open source production ready implementation of SPIFI. It's also a CNCF project. Uh, it's actually maintained by people who heavily contribute to the standard itself. Uh, and it's been also adopted by some popular tools like Envoy and Istio. Uh, have have integration with Spire, and Spire itself has been adopted by some uh, high-profile tech organizations. Uh, quickly about the history. So Spiffy was proposed uh, uh, by a guy called Joe Bida, who's one of the, the creators, original creators of Kubernetes. And uh, when he worked at Google, he proposed Spiffy at uh, Glucon conference in 2016. He impressed some people in uh, Silicon Valley who founded uh, Cytel, uh, the Cytel uh, startup to further develop the standard and to implement uh, the framework that would uh, implement the standard, uh, which they called Spire. Uh, then both projects were accepted to CNCF Foundation. Some years later, uh, Cytel was acquired by Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which wanted to continue with both projects and they were successful and both projects gr graduated in uh, in the foundation which means uh, they were considered as major stable and successfully uh, running in production environments uh, then spiral was founded uh, last year but i will maybe talk about spiral at the end if we have time uh, are these projects popular they are, like there, there's number of stars are growing uh, in GitHub repos. Google Trends is growing. It's not an explosion, but it's steady growth, I, I would say. So how does it work? So Spiffy, how, how does Spiffy solve identity? So there is a concept of a trust domain, which is a logical container for your workloads and identities. Uh, it could represent your whole organization, or you could have one domain for production environment, one for non-production, or you could have a domain per product if you want. And then you have Spiffy ID, which is a structured string. It follows universal resource identifier pattern, so scheme, authority, path, and in Spiffy case, the scheme is Spiffy, Authority is your trust domain, and then you have your workload. The workload part is not strictly specified. It could be GUID, uh, it could have a meaning, it could be workload name, and it could also have additional structures, so we could put more slashes there and make a path to your workload. So now, if you have identity, how do we verify that and the, uh, identity? How, we do, how do we authenticate? So Spiffy uh, introduces uh, Spiffy Verifiable Identity Document, SVIT. And it has two forms. One is uh, X509 certificate. The other one is JO token. And the document in both forms contains the Spiffy ID, and it contains a cryptographic proof that the workload that presents the document owns the identity. Uh, the document is signed by some authority that belongs to the trust domain. And uh, workloads can also load trust bundle, 
uh, which is public keys of the root authority that signed these uh, SVITs, and you can use the trust bundle then to verify uh, signature of these SVITs. So we have uh, identity, we have authentication, so we solved service-to-service -service authentication, right? Well, not completely, because uh, if we look at this picture, so imagine this green box is, uh, is the authority, I am the blue, uh, the blue workload, and the red workload is talking to me. So the authority will issue SWIT to the red uh, workload. Red workload will pass SWIT to me to prove its identity. So this part, we made this part easy. So I can just verify the signature of the authority with, with the public key. But we we implemented federated authentication, so we moved the hard part here. So how does the the authority uh, do the initial authentication? How does the authority verify identity of the red workload to issue that SWIT? So Spiffy says how you shouldn't do it. So Spiffy says you shouldn't use uh, shared secret for that. And it goes further, it says, you shouldn't actually require active participation of the workload to prove its identity. Uh, I skipped the workload API. So Spiffy also says, this interface should follow the specification. Uh, there are just a few of endpoints. There's endpoint, give me my SWIT in form of certificate, or give me my SWIT in form of JAW token, or give me the trust bundle. Uh, so back to the challenge. How can we possibly verify identity of the red workload if we cannot ask for secret or we cannot ask for any participation? So if you look at traditional factors of authentication, uh, there is something you know. So for people, it would be a password. For workload, it could be similarly some shared secret. Spiffy says, we shouldn't use this. Then there's something you have. For people, it would be, for example, an access card or a hardware token. For workloads, it could be a private key. And Spiffy says, yes, we want to use private keys, but not for the initial authentication. Then there is something you are. Uh, for people, it would be biometrics. There are some other uh, factors. Uh, there is somewhere somewhere you are. For people, it would be your geolocation. And there's something you can do. For people, it would be a written signature. And there's actually a nice uh, also example for, for workloads. Uh, there's ECMI protocol for domain uh, validated certificates where the workload can prove it can control a domain, right? Uh, but Spiffy says, you shouldn't require active participation of the workload, so we cannot use something you, you can do. We cannot use something you know. We use something you have, but not for the initial authentication, which leaves us with these two options. And that's exactly what Spiffy hints that we should use. We should, that the authority should, should introspect the workload, look at where it is running and how does it look, look at biometrics of, of the workload to verify the ident identity and then issue uh, the SVIT. So how does Spire implement it? This is the most basic setup uh, of Spire. You have a Spire server. Uh, you have one server per, per domain. And then it, you have Spire agents running closely to the workloads. And closely means on the same machi machine. And you may ask, OK, why do we need server? Can we just have, have a server? Why do we need agents? So there are two reasons for, for agents. One is uh, to distribute the load, because you can have hundreds of workloads in your domain, and you don't want to overload your server with all these requests. Give me my SVIT. So you distribute the load uh, between the agents. And second reason is when you install the agents close to the workload on the same machine, 
you have better option how to introspect the workload and look at the biometrics of the workload. So Inspire, it's called attestation. So you have workload attestation. Uh, so when workload asks uh, for uh, its SVIT, the agent will use attestation workload attestation plugin based on the platform where it's running. You can use Kubernetes attestation plugin or you can use AWS workload attestation plugin to introspect the workload and get some biometrics attributes about the workload, which Spire calls uh, selectors. And for example, if you have Kubernetes uh, workload attestation plugin, it will give you uh, selectors like these. There are more, but uh, these are, I think, the most interesting. And then if you have selectors like this, you can then define a workload registration entry where you say, if the selectors match these values, I will issue such spiffy ID. So in this example, if the namespace uh, in Kubernetes, uh, namespace of the workload equals ABC and service account is XYZ, I will issue this spiffy ID, and here you can say, see, we picked uh, the workload name. We we actually put namespace and a service account there as well. So this is the basic setup. It can have little twist uh, where you can offload authentication to uh, a sidecar proxy. So you will use service mesh, and then it's the proxy responsibility to call the Spire agent, get the, the SWIT, get the trust bundle, and uh, handle the MTLS uh, uh, between your services. Spire also supports serverless workloads, but here I would say it's sort of a crippled spiffy, because the challenge with a serverless workloads is uh, it's very hard or impossible to run the agent on the same machine as the serverless workload, right? So the Spire team decided to implement a push pattern where you can configure certain registration entries to be pushed to a particular secret store, and then the serverless workload loads its SVITs from the store. So there's no direct communication, there's no workload attestation between uh, the agent and the workload. So if you don't want to use Spire, you have few alternatives. The first one is, is the default. You accept the risk. Uh, another alternative is you don't use universal approach. So you have fragmented security silos. For on-prem, you have some approach. For AWS, you have different approach. And then you uh, try to make it work together. You can also use alternative implementations of uh, uh, Spiffy, for example, Spiral, uh, which uh, I showed uh, on the timeline. This is an interesting project uh, that started last year. Uh, it was started by two biggest individual contributors to the Spire project. Uh, so they left uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise and they started a new company and they uh, started building a new, this time, a commercial product that also uh, implements Spiffy. And uh, uh, they claim it should be simpler to use compared to Spire. But it's not, uh, there's not much information about the project yet. Uh, there's also a similar project uh, uh, maintained by Yahoo called Athens, which partially, partially implements Spiffy standard. Uh, it uses also certificates and mutual TLS, uh, but it's not that popular as, uh, as Spire. Then you can use uh, some cloud-native approaches to secure service to service communication, like Amazon uh, VPC Lattice in AWS. And then you can also uh, use service meshes with federation, and there it's not exactly an alternative, it's sort of complementary because most of these service meshes support uh, Spiffy or they even uh, use Spire or can use Spire uh, internally.
And that's it for me. No, it, okay, it works. Okay, questions? Quick. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question. C can you show the diagram with agent and server? It's uh, with what? Agent and server. Agent and server. Uh, this one, yeah. Uh, you you said you cannot store <clears throat> credentials uh, on the machine, but actually, how you authorize agent uh, in front of the server? You didn't say. Uh, uh, very good question. I I forgot to mention that. So I said there's workload attestation where you verify identity of the workload between agent and the workload. And there's a very similar concept called node attestation uh, where the server uh, verifies identity of the node where the agent is running. And again, you have uh, different node attestation plugins based on the environment where you run. So you can have AWS node attestation plugin, which will give you uh, the selectors uh, from AWS uh, identity document. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, uh, out of your experience, what is the footprint of this agent? You know, if you if I run it locally next to my service, you know, like so. Uh, there's uh, a nice documentation showing the configuration of uh, server and agent based on number of workloads and number of uh, number of agents. Uh, it's quite small. I think uh, two cores with two gigs of RAM is enough for 100 workloads, something like that. Okay, thank you.